Welcome back. Our next presenter will take us offshore to wind turbine farms and how their generator sounds potentially impact aquatic mammals. Frank Thompson from the DHI group will discuss how this constant noise may impact wildlife. Frank? Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about operational noise as opposed to pie driving and construction noise for offshore wind farms, which has been at the heart of my study since the last, let's say, 20 or 30 years because the sound levels during construction are considered to be very high. But today I'm going to talk about operational noise. There is a worldwide drive to renewables energy, uh, renewable energies in Europe, in Asia, and also in North America. You can see here the plants from the U US. In the offshore wind in the US is clearly on the rise with developers plan to bring 10 gigawatt online by 2026, so that's actually a lot of energy. And then also the state hopes to procure targets of about 40 gigawatt, 40 gigawatt by 2040. So there will be a lot of offshore wind farm turbines built in the US and anywhere else in the next, let's say, 10 or 20 years. And these turbines are getting actually much bigger. This picture is from the East Coast, but there's also developments, of course, planned on the West Coast of the US. And as I said, in Asia, Europe, where there are a lot of offshore wind farms and in other areas. Now, we know that from the environmental impacts, it's basically uh, bird strikes, collisions. There's also benthic habitats affected by offshore wind, and there's impacts on fisheries. But underwater noise has been always considered one of the biggest impacts or the most important impact. And that is because, of course, sound is an ideal, ideal medium for, for uh, water is an ideal medium for sound. It travels so much faster, and impact ranges can be very large. And these are what you can see here, the three uh, areas of the three phases of an offshore wind farm. Pre-construction is usually a very short phase of several weeks or you know, maybe a month. And it's not really uh, uh, looked upon in environmental impact assessment. Then you get construction. And we know that the sound levels during construction, when you use, for example, impact pile driving for big turbines, are very, very large, very high intensity sounds much above 200 uh, decibel relative to one micropascal, and impact ranges can be very large. We know, for example, in Europe, harbor porpoises, very small cetaceans, are avoiding offshore wind farm construction sites at a distance of about 20 to 25 kilometers. So we're talking about quite big impacts. And so far, and I have to pull back now, because I'm already advancing the story a little bit, so far, operation hasn't been considered a big issue because uh, the sound levels are much lower than during construction. They are basically triggered by the gearbox and the, the turbine. So, and sound levels, as I said, they are very low and not very far ranging, at least from the turbines we know. So in the study that we undertook here, we looked a little bit into the future. We extrapolated from existing uh, turbines, from existing 6 megawatt turbines up to 10 megawatt turbines, which is the future, and we assessed impact ranges based on US regulatory criteria. And what we found is that as turbines get bigger, they become noisier too. There was a very clear relationship between the size of the turbine and, of course, there are no more turbines and the underwater noise produced. The behavioral impact ranges could be more than one kilometer for drivetrain, which is a new design of offshore wind farm turbines, and more than six kilometer for gearbox, which is kind of the current design, but will, be, uh, you know, uh, will not be happening in the future. So we're talking about impact ranges from, from anywhere between one and two kilometers for the drivetrain technology. And you might think, you know, compared to the construction, this is actually very low. That's not very far ranging. But if you consider that offshore wind farms, the distance between the turbines is much less than a kilometer, then an entire offshore wind farm can become an in impact area for, for marine mammals. Doesn't mean that they use a site or they don't use a site any longer. We see in Europe, we see harbor porpoises frequently swimming in the sites. But it's, of course, something that you have to consider when it comes to the large weights, of course, here on the East Coast, for example. So the point we are making with this study is, yes, there can be an impact from operational um, uh, turbines. And uh, it should be looked after in environmental impact assessment, because currently it's very much concentrated on the construction uh, side. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Frank. I know you and I, previously to your uh, talk, were talking about birds and everything else. And yes. The, the impact on the mammals, and you talked about the porpoises actually coming and swimming around them. Yes. It sounds kind of weird. I think they're just using them for practice. But uh, have you been able to determine how 
specifically the the impact is on the mammals? I mean, are there, is it confusion or are they no, changing migratory patterns or anything like that? It's very difficult to study that in the field and you have to study it in the field to get the right impression. What we do is we put acoustic detectors out that actually detect the clicks, the echo sounds of the echo, echo location sounds, high frequency, high frequency clicks of the porpoises and we don't hear them during construction so we assume they are moving away. We actually don't really know that to a very large extent but we have some, some power tests where we can say when we bring out uh, dis uh, stations at different distances that the animals move out be by changing their, also changing their acoustics. So what, what happens to the animals, we, we really don't know, but we call it behavior avoidance. And on one of your slides, you were talking about the larger the turbine, the more noise, yes. obviously. But when you're talking about wind farm, turbine farms, you're talking about multiples. Do yes. they, is there an exponential kind of impact no, I, I wouldn't say so. I mean, what we, what we, our point is that the impact ranges can overlap. So actually an entire wind farm can become some kind of acoustical impact area. But what does it really mean? I mean, animals in the field make a cost-benefit analysis. We go shopping in a shopping center when it's very, very noisy and very loud. We, we take it for granted because it's, we want to buy some good things for us. And the animals do probably the same. They use these offshore wind farm areas because they are important for them. But of course, noise can have an impact, and this should be looked after, especially since these turbines will be in the waters for about 20 to 30 years after you know, installation. Question from the floor. Yeah, um, so do we have any ideas of what can be done to negate these effects? Is there some way of using something akin to noise dampening headphone methods, but on like a larger <laughs> That's scale? That's a great question. Um, what we do during construction, we actually install, it, construction is a bigger issue, so I can talk a little bit about that. What we do during construction is employ bubble curtains. So we, we have air bubble curtains around the pile driver and the sound is reflected and, and reduced to a very large extent. And there are all kinds of designs of the air bubble curtains and for example in Germany they are actually mandatory to be used. And that's a very effective uh, mitigation technology. For the, of course, you cannot put a bubble curtain at, uh, around an entire offshore wind farm. That would be a little bit overkill, especially since the sound levels are low. And it's very difficult to see, you know, how, how sound could be reduced here uh, because, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's quite difficult. So, because it's an entire wind farm that will probably have an impact. I have so many questions, but I'm going to try to keep okay. it to media ones. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is there any mock cone in the operational noise, the way we measure it for propagation in construction? There's what? Mock cone, that 17 degree angle that happens during hammering of the pile driving, when you have to consider that in transmission, your starter field for propagation. So it's an angle where you, where I don't understand. Oh, so when you're hammering the pile, the pile into the ground, yes. the way that the sound reverberates or vibrates off of that pile yes. creates a 17 degree conical shape. Yes. Mm -hmm. Upwards towards the surface. Yeah, we have modelers who do, do that for us, actually. Okay, kind of we do too. I was wondering if the operational noise has any sort of mock cone or if it's just a cylindrical starter field. No, no idea. Um, and then when you said behavioral response, you had a humpback whale up there, but off of the east coast, it's the North Atlantic right whale. Yes. So when you're saying behavioral impacts, are you taking transmission loss out? So like the noise levels fall to 160 dB yeah. and just looking at that range? Is that well, your one kilometer you to six? A, you, have a, you have an impact threshold. It's an impact threshold that's... Right, that's and for all whales is 160 dB receive, for behavioral. Yeah, unfortunately, because these, um, what, what I should mention is that these thresholds are all under revision now because usually you would have a probability function. You know that very mm -hmm. well from the work that has been done yeah. in Australia and other areas where animals react. Not every animal reacts at that threshold. The, the whole concept of thresholds is, is a little bit outdated, but mm -hmm. I'm sure that NOAA will revise the behavioral impact criteria very, very soon. Yeah, so when you were saying the behavioral ones, were you looking at frequency propagation for the frequencies used by North Atlantic right whales? No, you look at the broadband level at one, and you, uh, the, the level is 120 decibels received broadband. But over which decade bands? Since you had a humpback whale up there, I was thinking you were looking at it for the low frequency. No, cetaceans. you don't look at the low frequency for humpback whales because humpback whales are essentially mid frequency for a large baleen whale. The low frequencies are the right whales. Right, so I was one, just wondering where you're one sixth when you're summing. We don't. We don't. It's not. A, it's not a threshold that I have invented. It's not a threshold that I have thought of. I when know. We it's do, it's when Brandon Southall's. <laughs> when we do. When we do a hearing impairment, for example, we look at hearing loss and we do M weighting, because right. you know we weight the spectrum for the sounds according to the hearing of the receiver. That's of course really important to do. Mm -hmm. But for behavioral response. 
There are actually, and that's very interesting by a colleague of mine, there's a study uh, also, also postulating frequency-weighted behavioral thresholds, and they seem to be more sensible than the overall threshold that is postulated or has been used and used, and I'm sure it's going to be revised very, very soon. Yeah. We should chat later so we can get to the next one, because I do have <laughs> other questions. <laughs> Um, yeah, just one more. Can you go into more detail about what the difference is between the drive train and the gearbox and what that might mean? Well, the gearbox is a technical installation that drives the turbine, basically, and the drive train is directly, as far as I know, is directly installed in the turbine, so it doesn't create that, that much of a noise. It's a direct uh, drive train technology. That's, that's all I know about it. What we know is that there's only one, there's actually no data uh, very much from the drivetrains because there aren't any uh, new drivetrain turbines. The only one that we found was off Block Island, of course, the very first offshore wind farm in the U.S. And we could compare their noise levels to a to a comparable sized gearbox, and we found that difference of 10 dB. So there's a 10 dB. Well, what we found was in one case a 10 dB difference between drivetrain and the uh, gearbox. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thanks. Important information to consider as we try and find renewable energy nice sources. <laughs> We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Especially after